Welcome to Blood Flow, where creativity meets science. I'm Jonathan Hamill, a doctor specialized in blood circulation and novelist from Paris. On this podcast, through conversations with world-class experts in the domains of science and art, we will explore the hidden links between the pulse of life and the rhythm of creativity. My guest today is Nicole Stott. Nicole is an American engineer and a retired NASA astronaut with two space flights and 104 days as a crew member on both the International Space Station and the Space Shuttle. She was the 10th woman to ever perform a spacewalk. Nicole was also the first person to live tweet from space and the first person to paint with watercolor in space. After her retirement from NASA, she co-founded the Space for Art Foundation, where children create art as a planetary community from hospitals, refugee centers, orphanages, and schools from around the world. Nicole holds an MS degree in engineering management and started her career performing structural analysis of advanced jet engine components designs. She's also an instrument rated private pilot and a NASA aquanaut who once spent 18 days living and working on the Aquarius underwater habitat. Her book, Back to Earth, is available everywhere books are sold, and it's super interesting, so I recommend it. <laughs> you can find all the information about Nicole and the Space for Art Foundation at nicolestott.com and spaceforartfoundation.org. So Nicole, welcome to the show. Thanks, thanks. Nicely done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can end here. <laughs> okay, see you, bye. <laughs> bye. So, so your first uh, space flight was uh, in 2009, where you were mission specialist on uh, STS-128, a NASA space mission to the uh, International Space Station. But you joined NASA in 1988 at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. So 21 years later, you board your first mission to space. <laughs> so what was the timeline once the idea had formed in your head that you could become an astronaut? Uh, what was the selection process like? But how did uh, you spend all those years? Well, I mean, I, yeah, like you said, I had, I was about 10 or 11 years uh, with NASA as an engineer before becoming an astronaut. And that was between time on the space shuttle and the space station program at the Kennedy Space Center here in Florida, and then a couple years as a flight engineer on the shuttle training aircraft, which was this really cool airplane we used to train the astronauts how to land the space shuttle at Johnson Space Center. And I don't know, you know, maybe I was slow or something. I mean, I was old enough, you know, or I am old enough that I saw the first moon landing and you know, I think that was really inspirational. But as a kid, you know, six or seven, you realize, I think that that's super extraordinary. But for me, it didn't, it wasn't that point in time where I said, oh my gosh, I'm going to be an astronaut. I'm going to do everything I have to do to become an astronaut. It just wasn't that. I found I was more interested in learning about how things fly. And if you want to know how airplanes fly, why would you not want to know how rocket ships fly? And it just kind of evolved. And it wasn't until probably eight into the 10 years of working as an engineer that I started even thinking about astronaut. And because up till then, too, I thought, oh, that's something other special people get to do. You know, why would they ever pick me? Why should I even apply? You know, the way we tend to, in a silly way, talk ourselves out of something before somebody else has even told us no. And I, I guess, long story short, you'll find I'm a rambler. Uh, I reached out to a couple of people I considered to be mentors they encouraged me to pick up the pen and fill out the application. I am very thankful to them. I don't think I ever would have done it on my own, even after seeing what astronauts and learning what astronauts do, you know, that most of their time, almost probably 99% of it is not flying in space and that they were doing a lot of what I was doing as a NASA engineer. I think I would have talked myself out of it. Yeah. So very and were thankful. These, these mentors, they were astronauts? Um, no, they were my bosses, really, people that I worked very closely with at the Kennedy Space Center. But they were gentlemen that had a lot of experience across, you know, many different programs from the Apollo time till yeah. present time. And they knew, you know, they knew the whole world of it. And thankfully, they encouraged me to apply. Yeah. yeah. So once you started the, the astronaut training, um, so what, what is it two years, two, three years before you actually take off at the Kennedy Space Center? <laughs> <laughs> I wish, I wish. So when I, when I was selected, which was back in 2000, I can't believe it was that long ago, uh, we were told at the time it would be five to six years before we flew. 
And sadly, you know, because of the Columbia accident, the Columbia space shuttle accident in 2003, what was expected to be five to six turned out to be like eight to 10 years for us to fly. And so my first flight wasn't until 2009, but man, you're just doing, you know, I always looked at the opportunity to fly in space, even if I was called an astronaut, uh, as this bonus to all the other work that we do, right? You know, the, the stuff that we're doing in that 99% of the time down here on Earth. So, yeah, it was nine years before I actually had my first space flight. And so you were continuing to work as an engineer, plus doing the, the training to be an astronaut at the same time? Yeah, pretty much. And then in addition to kind of the engineering stuff, you know, we got to help with, you know, being in mission control, talking to the people that were in space, uh, learning how to do spacewalks, learning how to fly the robotic arm about all the science and the, the spaceships, but helping develop the new programs that were coming along. So kind of getting it embedded in all of what was happening at that time and what we were looking forward to in the future as well. Mm. So you were becoming an astronaut, even though you were yeah. years before the, the first flight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So part of the training that, that fascinated me, because I really had never heard of it, was your time uh, underwater, actually, in the, I think it's called the NEMO, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's called an aquanaut. Uh, can you tell us a little bit what the NEMO is and why it was designed? Yeah, I mean, you know, when I think about it, most of the training that we do as astronauts, even if it's, you know, learning another language or it's how the how the science works or how the spaceship works embedded in it somehow is how do you work as a good team as a crew you know how do you discover your own strengths and weaknesses and those of your potential crewmates and how you'll bring that all together for a successful mission and um the nemo missions which stands for and i think they just wanted to call it nemo so they figured out how to make this acronym work the nemo missions were the nasa extreme environment mission operations and uh it really yeah we got to go live underwater for 18 days in this undersea habitat called aquarius it was about the size of a school bus there were six of us on board and the thing that really is so perfect about it and why it's such a wonderful analog to living and working in space is that you are in a real extreme environment you can't, you know, you can't just walk out the door if something goes wrong and hop in the minivan. You you are in a place where you have to figure out how to deal with things that go wrong in that place at 60 feet underwater. And so, so cool. Um, highly recommend it too. I mean, it gives you a whole new like perspective on our planet from being an immer- immersed in it. And yeah, just a really wonderful way to prepare to go to space. So uh, when you when you do go um, uh, scuba diving, I guess uh, do you, how much sixty feet? So how many meters? Twenty? Do you do you still see the surface when you're when you're down there? Um, kind of, depending on you know how bright it is up there. I mean, you can see that that's the surface. You know, you're not you know sixty feet, twenty. You know, maybe what eighteen, seventeen, eighteen meters is. Um, uh, it's not that deep, but it's deep enough that it affects your body, right? So yeah. once you're down there for an hour, your body is so saturated with nitrogen that you can't just swim safely to the surface if something goes wrong. So mm. you have to figure out how to manage that until you're in a safe configuration. Um, you have to figure out how to manage it that at 60 feet with your crew. And that, so did you find any differences, uh, mentally speaking, about living underwater and living in space? Or did you really feel like it really prepared you really well for living in, living in space? Yeah, I think it prepared me really well. And, yeah. and, and because I think the, the missions are built purposely to do that, in addition to being in an environment where you can't just, you know, go out the door without special equipment on and you have to be able to communicate, you know, we always, you know, we talked about communicating from undersea to our topside team, whereas in space, you're talking down to, you know, your mission control team on the ground and how you manage the equipment you were going to wear and the science you were doing both in and outside of the habitat and the way you worked as a crew. And just like when I think about all the training that I did in preparation for going to live and work in space, the Nemo mission was absolutely an all in one kind of training environment was absolutely the best for that. Mm. 
Um, so your training uh, took you around the world. You don't only train in the U.S. Um, so you talk, you write about uh, training in one of the worst uh, Russian winters in history. I was <laughs> <laughs> wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that and also why you have to train in these extreme cold conditions. Yeah, well, the reason we do, I mean, we do water survival and cold weather survival and, you know, land survival and it all in, in pretty extreme conditions. They never can, you know, know that it's going to be the worst winter in a hundred years, but um, it kind of works out nicely when it is for <laughs> testing out the equipment and how you'll work as a crew. But the idea is that, you know, part of what we do is we fly as an international partnership, which is why we travel all around the world. You know, we've got... Um, five international space agencies involved with the space station program, which is, you know, 16 different countries. And we need to train in all of those different places. Um, but these, these kind of survival courses, which I'll just tell you, they're some of the most fun things that we get to do, but they're also the things you realize that in real life, you don't really want to have to do them, <laughs> but it's in case the spaceship lands somewhere that it wasn't planned to land. And, uh, and how do you use your equipment? How do you work as a crew? How do you survive together? And uh, I'll tell you, I was really happy, you know, to have minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit, dry and not really windy, that I was much happier than it would be if it was like just above freezing and kind of slushy, rainy, yeah. I would, I'd take dry and cold over that any day. Yeah. And you also had to learn uh, Russian, right? Which, yeah. Um, yeah. How did, how, <laughs> this is only because the Soyuz spacecraft is um, is in Russian. And I, that was surprising to me. That, so that when you're in the Soyuz, you um, communicate with uh, Earth and you have to speak Russian. Is yeah, that still the case? It, it is. So if you're going to fly on the International Space Station, uh, which thankfully on board the space station the official language is english so everybody has to know how to speak english and i'm i'm so thankful that it's not the other way around and um and then everyone has to learn to speak russian because at the time i flew the russian soyuz spacecraft was our rescue vehicle too in case of an emergency and like you said all the instrument panels all the procedures, the way you would talk to people on the ground is all in russian so you had to be fluent enough to you know, safely, um, you know, and in a, a, in a good way, be able to use your equipment and speak to your crew in the ground. Yeah, that's so crazy. <laughs> absolutely the most difficult part of astronaut training for me yeah, was I can't to learn they another language. They, they didn't take people on the ground who spoke English. It's, <laughs> well, they all do speak English. But oh, the, okay. that, that vehicle, that Russian spacecraft is all in Russian. And I don't blame them, you know, for to have to retrain the team on the ground would be more difficult than just training a few of us how to mm. speak Russian. But for me, oh my gosh. Yeah. That for somebody who somehow, and I blame my mom, ha never in all of my schooling later ever learned another language. I don't know how that happened. But then after, you know, you're over 40 and you're trying to program your brain to um, learn a new one. Quite thankfully, a challenge. The, you know, thankfully the alphabet is phonetic. And so <laughs> at least that going for us. Yeah. Um, and then did you also have to learn some Japanese or some French, um, or what that was it? Not required at all, but I think all of us felt like wherever we were traveling, it was just polite to, you know, at least learn how to say hello, goodbye, thank you, all the polite kinds mm. of things. And then, you know, you always learn a couple other words along the way as well that are just fun, but, um, but it wasn't required. Mm. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could tell us uh, about uh, the way space and space programs, although they started as a sort of competition between the USA and Russia during the Cold War, um, has evolved into a kind of a model of integration and cooperation between nations. Um, most notably, it started, I think, in 75 with the Apollo Soyuz test program, with this yeah. sort of collaboration uh, in, in space and on the ground. Yeah, I think it's one of these. And My husband jokes that the ISS, which stands for International Space Station, should maybe be called the Invisible Space Station because, you know, people don't tend, which is sad to me, don't tend to know about it necessarily, right, until they do discover it and then they get excited about it. But I really believe that all we've done, like you say, from the time of Apollo Soyuz, which was still during, you know, some pretty um, interesting times, not to say that we're not in interesting times again, <laughs> 
but um, that we could figure out how important it was for us to work together, to have that handshake, you know, between a Soviet commander, cosmonaut commander and a U.S. astronaut commander in space, you know, technically bringing it together and then from the humanity side of it, bringing it together. And that really was our first steps towards this continuous international cooperative presence in space. And I think it's hugely important to me. It is the ways that we've managed to live and work together peacefully, successfully for over 20 years now on the, the space station. It's such a wonderful model for how we should be looking at each other and figuring out how to make crewmates down here on Spaceship Earth as well. And do you usually uh, know uh, your fellow uh, astronauts, your crew before, um, before you get to, to the space station? How yeah, absolutely. I mean, we try, we've been assigned together to fly, um, you know, usually several years in advance of the flight itself. And that's not to say that, you know, a crew member here or there might shift around to another mission. Um, but we've trained together, we know each other, which is really nice. And then in general, though, I mean, the overall community of astronauts across all the five different agencies is relatively small. Yeah. So you're going to have met each other, been um, had some kind of training thing somewhere or even, you know, uh, you know, fun events somewhere along the way. So you'll know each other. And that that's a huge deal, I think, to have that. Yeah, because you're going to be living in close quarters for yeah. Yeah. many days. Yeah, but it's um, kind of cool that even if you haven't, because they've had to swap crew members out at the last minute on different um, crews before. And the way that we train together down here on Earth, kind of the consistency in that, regardless of where you are in each of the different countries, even if you hadn't like specifically trained for a mission for years with each other, the kind of protocols and the rules of engagements and the way you work together in general is there in place for us already. So yeah, you, you um, share a common language uh, already. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> even if you don't speak it. So to speak. <laughs> And was there some part of uh, the training focused on training your mind for the experience of uh, living in space? I guess living underwater could count. Um, is there therapy as compulsory part of uh, training uh, or screening of uh, psychological uh, issues? Uh, because then once you're in space, I guess, I guess you know, you, yeah. it's a little too late. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, I was really thankful. I mean, I, I don't think there's generally an issue anyway because of the way we're prepared. But some of these in extreme environments that we go into, right? I mean, part of it is how how psychologically are you going to deal with things too? And I think they prepare us really well. I mean, before we're even selected, you've done this battery of written and, you know, kind of interview, psychological interview things where... Uh, you know, questions like, would you rather be a florist or an auto mechanic? And I'm like, what's wrong with either one of those? You know, <laughs> apparently there's some mysterious little way of telling psychologically what's going on with you from that. But I think every experience we have together in one way or another is looking either from the outside or from us inside on how, how am I going to deal with this? And I think they realize it's an important part of it. And, you know, things like claustrophobia and stuff like that, you're going to figure that out before you even get selected. And um, but the dynamics that can happen that can come up between, you know, crewmates and, you know, people from different places, culturally, all of those kinds of it's real. So we have to um, we have to consider it as part of the training and, mm -hmm. and things like Nemo, where you are absolutely in a place where you're dependent on the way you're going to deal with each other. Um, yeah, I think it plays out, you know, nicely to see mm -hmm. how you'll behave. And uh, is the flight surgeon uh, always part of the crew on a space mission? Because I know that you write in the book that in the early days, it was mainly pilots um, uh, that were, yeah, yeah, I guess pilots that were becoming astronauts. And then it kind of diversified. So I was wondering yeah. if it's always, there's always, or some sort of, I guess, medical training for everyone in the crew. Yeah, we, there's just because there's not, it, there's not enough space flights or enough crew member positions to always have a dedicated flight surgeon, like an actual trained flight surgeon on your crew. We do have one on the ground that's assigned to us, multiple actually. And also we have psych support on the ground in case we need it. 
Um, within the crew itself, though, um, at least two people we trained as medical officers. So you go through some, I was like that on both of my missions. And so you go through some additional training to know where all the equipment is and how to respond to things and um, how to communicate with the ground if something's happening. So sadly, you can't have a doctor on every flight um, with you personally in that place, but we know we have wonderful support on the ground for that as well. So before you launch, uh, I didn't know this either. You were quarantined for 10 days, uh, yeah. I guess mainly to avoid getting sick. Um, and one of the goals is also to adapt your circadian rhythm to the time of the launch uh, to be ready if you have to launch at 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. Uh, I was just wondering how you uh, progress progressively uh, move uh, to be ready at that time. Do you, do you go by uh, hour to hour just moving it to be awake at four or how, is there a process no. for that? <laughs> uh, well, there is a process, but we pretty much, if, and I don't know if they've changed it since then. Uh, I don't think so. But when you roll into quarantine, it's kind of, you, you know, you, you just shift. <clears throat> you just shift to that time. They have lighting set up in the crew quarters that supports that. They have these really amazing curtains that keep the light out of any room that, or bring it in if needed. Um, you know, for any, any place where you are within crew quarters and, you know, then all your meals and your bedtime and all of that is, is shifted to that. And I'll tell you, I felt totally prepared, totally comfortable by the time we um, launched to be adjusted. I mean, my first mission originally was like supposed to be at like four o'clock in the morning. And then it shifted back with our delays to I think we launched one minute before midnight. And then my second flight, we launched in the middle of the day. And But then the thing is, that's all associated with your launch time. So you'll be ready for launch. But once you get to the station or into space, now you have to readjust to what the space station operating time is. So there's a little I bit was, of a jet laggy thing that kind of goes yeah, on. For the I was first wondering about too. that. How do you uh, decide um, what, uh, what time it is on the space station? <laughs> <laughs> on space station, we work to GMT. So okay. um, a little, I beg, think an hour off from where you are. But uh, yeah, which is nice. It, and they pick that because I think between all of the five agencies, it's kind of a neutral, relatively neutral, I guess, time, the easiest for all, all of the countries to manage. And uh, yeah, so then you have to shift again from your launch time to GMT. And right. I don't know, you got so much adrenaline and it's all yeah. pumping, you, you figure it out. Yeah. And so talking about adrenaline, I was super surprised because you, so you explain on launch day, you get, you get there a few hours before you, you wave goodbye to the families. Um, so you get, you strap in. And so you explained that you actually took a nap, which I found <laughs> quite surprising with all the adrenaline. Yeah. You know, it was interesting to me too, but I think you get so, I mean, we train so much for being in that place. You know, of course, it's not the real day when you're training, but and there is a lot of adrenaline pumping for sure. But you're comfortable in that place. You're comfortable strapped into that seat. You're, you know, you have a few hours, so why not rest? Um, I did. I mean, my crewmates did the same. You know, they were, you know, chilling and you know, resting as well. Um, I think it's good, kind of, just to put yourself in that place and really feel comfortable there. Yeah. 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 It means that you were really prepared. Yeah. I'm sure. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to give a, a few numbers that um, I, m people may not be familiar with. Uh, so it takes eight and a half minutes to get to space or get, get to orbit. How do you say? It? Yep. Get to orbit. Yep. Uh, then it takes 92 minutes to orbit the Earth on the space station at a speed of 17,500 miles per hour. So that's a sunset or sunrise every 45, 46 minutes. Yeah. Uh, the space station, as you said, is maintained by five space agencies. And I didn't know this, it's the size of a football field. So quite large. Yep. Um, so in your opinion, apart from um, the obvious beauty of it, uh, what does seeing a sunset and a sunrise uh, every 45 minutes uh, do to the mind uh, of an astronaut? <laughs> <laughs> I think it like just um, impresses you with the awesomeness that we're surrounded by all the time. You know, even if you're not in space, seeing a sunrise or a sunset every 45 minutes, it's just... I mean, I think it, it takes a little while to get your brain wrapped around the fact that you're even in this place. Like, oh my gosh, I made it. I'm alive. I'm here. And, and then really just this appreciation of the uniqueness of it, of which 
those sunrises and sunsets are one of the really unique things about orbiting the earth and being in that special place. And, you know, the way the space station is set up, there's windows, but it's not like the sun comes up and this big blast of light comes in and the sun goes down and it's really dark. I mean, you kind of have to purposely go to the windows to experience that, but just knowing that's happening and just knowing you could float in front of that window and experience that every, you could orbit the earth an hour and a half and see that, you know, wonderfulness happening out there uh, below you is it's pretty extraordinary. Yeah. yeah. So what can you tell us about the, the overview effect? Um, I think, I think you're, maybe that's what you're describing already, but. Uh, I think it's part of it for sure. I, you know, the overview effect, the, these two words that were coined by, just a really, you need to talk to this guy. <laughs> you need to talk to Frank White sometime. Really one of the most thoughtful, humble human beings I have ever met. Um, he came up with this philosophy, this idea of what astronauts, of what people would experience when they separate from Earth and get to experience it from that vantage point. And he was so on it. I mean, I didn't even know those two words before I flew, but I knew I had, I was like, what am I, what is this? How do I sum it up? And he did it just beautifully. But it's, it's really meant to address this kind of cognitive shift that you have, this reality check of who and where we all are in space mm-hmm. together, you know. Um, in the end, for me, it, it ends up being about the simple stuff, you know, like, oh, my gosh, we live on a planet, you know, that we're all earthlings, thin blue line, that kind of thing being the only border that's important. And the interconnectivity of absolutely everything, everyone that's, you know, in this place that's you know, perfect distance from the sun to support us and how, how we need to accept our role, you know, proactively, actively when we're in that place um, to, to maintain its ability for us to survive and not just survive, but I'd say thrive there. So mm-hmm. it's kind of a call to action, really. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd love the comp- com- comparison uh, between the, the thin blue line, the atmosphere uh, surrounding the Earth and protecting protecting the Earth and the thinness of uh, the spaceship uh, hull, uh, protecting, as you say, from the deadly vacuum yes. space. <laughs> <laughs> it works both what... ways. Yeah, that spaceship, that machine or here on Earth. Yeah. Yeah. How thin is actually is because is, you, you repeated many times. I was like, how thin is it actually? Is it is it really, really thin because of the weight or how? how... Is it the uh, atmosphere you mean or the no, the, no, no, the, the spaceship hull? Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. How thin? I mean, like aluminum sheep thin kind of. Really? Yeah. I, I don't know what that would be. Um, eighth of an inch, not quarter. Yeah. I, I can't remember the numbers. My brain doesn't hold that stuff, but it's thin. It's like thin sheet metal. Really? And then, of course, on the outside of it, we have this other material like blankets and things that kind of set off from the hull itself with this um, protective fabric, you know, for to keep, you know, protect from debris hits and that kind of thing. But it it is a thin metal hull. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I was wondering because (laughs) many times in the book, very thin. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Like one centimeter or something, I guess. Uh, Probably. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to look that up. Um, That's a good question. I should know that. (laughs) (laughs) Think sheet metal. (laughs) Okay. I think she, so. The the motto, I guess, unofficial of the International Space Station is uh, "Off the Earth for the Earth." Um, so I guess it's a way of saying that all that's done in the space station is done um, to better life on Earth. Uh, and you explain that a big part of what astronauts do in space um, is to conduct experiments designed by scientists that are on the ground. Um, so how much time do you spend training for these experiments while you're on the ground? Uh, so you, I guess you have to get everything perfect the first time. So how, how hope, is that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah how, how, how do you work on that? Well, we have, I mean, I would say probably once you're assigned to a flight and you're learning all about the particulars that are going to happen on that flight itself, it's probably 50, 50 that you're spending time learning about the science and the experiments you're going to do. And then the other half of your time is, okay, what's this particular spacewalk I'm going to do? Or how I'm going to fly the robotic arm or maintaining the space station itself? Um, Because that's kind of the mix of stuff that we do while we're up there. You really are this jack of all trades, you know, which makes it so much fun, you know, to be fixing the toilet one day, doing science one day, doing a spacewalk another day. It's really incredible. But 
we we have a wonderful team that trains us on just the general science um, and the facilities that we have on board the station. And then they bring in, we actually get to work with the, the principal investigators, the researchers that have developed these experiments. And they're so excited about finally getting to fly it to space. And so we feel very, um, I don't know, there's, there's like this huge weight, I would say, you know, that you feel to make sure, like you said, that you want to perfectly implement this for them. You want them to be able to learn what they're hoping from it or be surprised by what, you know, they've put up there and what they learn. So, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, the science say, represents. Like, sometimes it's, uh, as you say, it's their life's work and, uh, so, and that you're, you have in your hands. So. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> no no pressure. pressure, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it is really, I mean, really we are really well, like we, we want to know what the science is about and so we can communicate it. Um, and they do a really good job. They kind of bring it down to a kindergarten level for us so that we could, we could explain it if we needed to, we can understand why it's important to do something in the order that it says or in the way. And, um, and yeah, you want to bring it to life for them. And it was one of the best parts of being in space was that interaction with um, those folks on the ground. And whether it was us as the experiment, you know, like the guinea pig for the experiment, or, you know, we had this cool combustion chamber with, you know, fuels, different kinds of fuels burning or plant growth experiments or protein crystal growth. I mean, pretty much across any area of science you can imagine. It's yeah, happening can, can you there. tell us a little bit about some of the experiments uh, you were involved in and the, the effects they had, um, the applications that ended up uh, happening uh, on Earth? Uh, yeah, you know, we have one of my favorite things was the plant growth. And it seems it almost seems like science fair kinds of stuff, you know, like, oh, this just seems so simple. We're going to figure out how to grow plants in, you know, in space and but the, oh my gosh, the, the science that's going into, because we don't have dirt, you know, on the space station, we don't have big buckets of dirt or pots or anything. So you're trying to figure out how can you, in the most compact, efficient way, um, develop these mediums that the plants can grow in, they can thrive, they can be nutritious if you're growing them for food um, and the most nutritionally dense kind of food that you can grow. And to just see that, I mean, I remember my, one of my favorites was these tiny little flowers. They were like, you know, just a couple inches tall, these like little feathery, like mini, ba mini baby breath flowers that we would harvest and send to the ground. And just to be able to open those little boxes up and have this plant, I mean, because you could smell it, you know, if you had it up close, it just smelled like green plant. And that was always really special, I think, from the human side of being in space too, in this really sterile environment and to have a plant there. I mean, something so simple, like that represents earth, I guess. And then on our bodies, we're doing, I mean, pretty much any output product you can provide blood, urine, spit, skin, whatever, hair, they want it packaged up and sent to the ground and um, to see how our body is responding mm -hmm. to that microgravity environment. One of the biggest, I would say two of the biggest things that we look at are you know, bone and muscle loss, mm -hmm. you know, because you really go into kind of an accelerated osteoporosis when you get there. And so we have to counteract that with exercise and all kinds of things. And then circulation too. I know you're, you're a circulation guy, right? And um, how that, you know, we get to space and we're floating and all the fluids in our body shift up towards our head. Mm -hmm. And the muscle loss isn't just like, you know, your bicep, it's your heart. And Right. the way your blood is pumping to your brain and you know how that might get stalled in your carotid and what yes. are the impacts of that the pressure on the back of our eyes all of these things that are happening just because we're in this floaty environment and yeah, that kind of I'm... stuff is super cool to me and the way it comes back to earth you know the plants the what's happening with us the fuel all of it I mean, I, yeah, I'm a ramble. I could talk about this stuff all day and it's oh, yeah. so there's, exciting there's, to me. There's yeah. a lot to, to unpack. Yeah, for sure. I want to stop on this uh, experiment about the ultrasounds of the uh, juggler veins that uh, I think came out last year and you mentioned it in the book. Um, so you were uh, at, on the space station and all the astronauts had, um, I guess, ultrasounds of the interior juggler vein, which is here. And so the results were reverse of the blood flow in six out of 11 astronauts. And actually one of the astronauts had a blood clot in one of them, which um, 
So that had never been studied, apparently. Um, not looked at in that way, or at least not seen. Um, I don't think that the reversal had been seen before. Hmm. Um, I, I, as far as I know, we had never, you know, measured or, um, you know, seen for sure any kind of clotting happening. But I think it's a really, it's certainly an important thing for us to discover if that person that experienced it, sure. and how you, you know, remedy that while you're in that place and then be prepared for when you get home and what you might have to deal with afterwards. Um, yeah. And so what were the implications, if any, uh, of, for later space travel uh, in sort of uh, treatment, preventive treatment, or um, do you know anticoagulants uh, given preventively? Uh, not, I, I'm not aware if we have any kind of protocol now that says, you know, here's a person that might be more predisposed to something like this. And should we be, um, you know, like pharmaceutically uh, yeah. you know, kind of trying to counter that in advance? And I don't know that anything in the general population of astronauts is happening that way. Um, but certainly if we're going to fly to Mars, right? And we're not going to have the Hollywood spaceship that's spinning and giving us this load on our bodies for some period of time each day, or maybe continuously on a lower level for that six to nine months that it takes to get to Mars. You know, we're going to be exposing our bodies in a much more significant way to that microgravity environment. And we're going to have to think about things like that. We're going to have to think about that. We're going to have to think about, um, you know, how we counter the bone and muscle loss. I mean, you know, on these little spaceships that we're talking about right now to go to Mars, there's not even really going to be the facility to do the same kind of, uh, you know, resistive exercise that we can do really effectively now on the space station because of that huge space that mm -hmm. we have inside of the ship. So these, some of these things we've learned already are going to be really, really important for us to carry forward with what we're going to do in a significantly different kind of spaceship and environment. Yeah, because you need the space to have uh, like the, the, what do you use to to train? Like you, you have, need to be strapped in some sort of a uh, uh, machine to, to jog or um, what, what sort of tools, techniques do you use yeah. to, to um, you know, combat muscle atrophy and osteoporosis? I guess there's a specific training that you have to do every day. Yeah, I mean, we exercise two hours a day on the space station. And I'll tell you, I, you know, I wish I had somebody telling me to exercise two hours a day down here. I mean, I came back from space, you know, in reality in better shape than I was before I went because who has two hours a day to exercise, but, um, really effective machines up there right now. We have a treadmill, of course you have to, that gives you some aerobic and resistive exercise. You know, you have to have a harness that loads you down to hold you onto the the belt to run. We've got a cycle ergometer. So like a bike that you can set load on. And that, of course, gives you a little resistive, but primarily um, cardio. And then we have this amazing resistive exercise device that, you know, there's nothing, it doesn't, nothing weighs anything, but we can use these vacuum canisters to create a load mm -hmm. that we can then do all the major muscle group exercise that you could do in a gym, you know, squats, mm -hmm. deadlifts, rows, presses, all of it. And it's, it's really super effective, but it's a big machine. It's big. Mm. It would probably take up the bulk of the spaceship we're talking about going to Mars in right now. You know, you oh. do not have the the volume inside of these spaceships we're envisioning initially to accommodate something like that. So mm. what are we going to do? Go back to the rubber bands or something? You, you, you have to think about it differently. So we're going to have to consider pharmaceutically, you know, um, the food we eat, the supplements that we have, all of that is going to have to be really, really seriously looked at from a countermeasure standpoint to make sure you're not just a blob when you get to Mars. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and right now, in case of a medical emergency in space, you mentioned the, the Soyuz. Uh, so you have a, like an emergency exit. Uh, I mean, it does take a while, I guess, to get back. Uh, what is the, the best and fastest way uh, to send an astronaut back to Earth in case of a real medical emergency? Um, well, the best way would be any of, I mean, any of the spacecraft that we have now, the two primary ones we have are still the Russian Soyuz spacecraft. And also um, we're flying humans now to the station on the SpaceX Dragon capsule. So either one of those, if you really needed to get somebody back to earth, um, you can detach from the station. And it's kind of funny, like in an hour, you're back on earth somewhere. 
you know, from the time, you know, yeah, from the time you separate and then you burn your engines to come back in, depending on where you want to land on Earth, um, you know, you can be back in an hour. And um, the problem is, you know, would you want to put somebody who's in some kind of distress into that landing situation? So there would be a lot of balancing out, you know, is this, um, uh, you know, uh, critical enough that we want to get this person back? Or are we going to do more damage to them if we try to get them back than if we try to deal with it on orbit? And on orbit, we have a lot of facilities, at least on the space station right now, we have um, to deal with stuff in communication with the ground. But, uh, and thankfully, I'm knocking on wood, you know, we've never had something as emergent that would require us to yeah, um, can, can you walk back. us through through that that one hour? Because I guess even just not just the landing, but even the trip must be very hard physically, right? Well, I mean, you know, I I got to fly on the space shuttle, which um, you know the the trip the trip up is what's the much more dynamic ride on the space shuttle. You had those big solid rocket boosters, and I mean, you were shaken, and <laughs> it, it was amazing. I mean, I smile because it's just definitely one of those woohoo kind of things. Um, and the ride home on the space shuttle was just like this graceful, I mean, you dropped back into the atmosphere and that doesn't mean it wasn't, you know, super hot and deadly outside. And there wasn't a lot of action going on, but it was just a really graceful ride back to this little chirp on the runway. Hmm. Um, the vehicles that we're flying now, the Soyuz and the dragon, they come back, you know, they reenter the atmosphere after they separate from space or from the space station, they're dropping into the atmosphere in an accelerated way. Um, you know, they've got material on the bottom that's basically kind of burning away as they re-enter. And then it's under spa- under parachutes that right. they end up coming back down. And um, Dragon lands in the water, Soyuz lands in the middle of the desert of, you know, of Kazakhstan. And I can tell you for both of them, it's kind of like little car crash as you, as you hit. Right. Um, so, yeah. I will, so it's so a pretty, you know, you're loaded up, it's fast, it's, you know, a, a pretty big jolt when you hit the ground or the water. And so if you had somebody that was in distress, yeah, um, sure. and you have to strap in kind of into this, you know, you're in a pretty, you know, kind of fetal position. <laughs> so, you know, if somebody has a, a significant head injury, or, you know, I, I mean, it, you just have to be very thoughtful about whether or not right. you strap somebody in to bring mm. them home. Yeah. Interesting. So let's talk a little bit about uh, art. Um, yeah. I was wondering what made you decide to bring uh, your watercolor kit on uh, on your space flight, and um, tell us a little bit about the specificities of painting in space. Yeah, you know, I'm so thankful to my friend Mary Jane Anderson. She um, was the one who encouraged me to bring something, you know, mm-hmm. something that I enjoy doing down here on Earth to space with me, and. She's a dear friend, but she also was the person that helps us pack all our stuff to take to space. And I would not have thought about it. I mean, I knew that other people had played music in space and done art or written poetry and, you know, those kinds of things before me. But I was so on my first space flight, especially so worried about making sure I had all the stuff I needed to not screw up while I was there, too. You know, my checklists and all of these things. And I was very thoughtful, I think, about taking things for my family and my friends that I could share the experience with them. I wasn't really thinking about it. And she just, she encouraged me. I took the small watercolor kit in the end. Um, Anything you do take, they have to check it out and make sure that it's not going to off gas something that'll be toxic in the atmosphere or, you know, it's not going to make a huge mess or, you know, whatever they, they have to check it out first. It was watercolor was the white way to go. Um, And I wish I would have videotaped, the whole thing. I have one picture of painting in space that I'm very thankful to my crewmate Bob for, but I didn't think to videotape it because I think the whole process would have been a nice way to show just what it's like to live and work in space. This where everything floats and you have to keep track of stuff and water behaves differently. So, you know, you don't have cups of water to dip your brush into. You're dipping your brush into this floating ball of water and you know, watching your brush kind of approach the ball and it moving onto the end and mixing it with the color. And um, it was a really, I don't know, it's kind of, I like to think of it like putting a human in human space flight when we do these kinds of things. We want to take what we know of our humanity with us wherever we go. And painting was certainly that for me. Yeah. Yeah. And what uh, new insights did painting in space give you on, uh, on painting or on art in general, what do you think? 
Well, I think it, you know, it made me realize that no matter where we go, we're going to want to do these things, right? You know, we're going to want to paint, we're going to want to play music, write poetry, so whatever it is that we as humans like doing independent of our work day stuff. And so we're going to have to accommodate that for sure. It made me um, realize that things like that are what, you know, give us the, the human connection to the experience that we're having too. You know, the painting I did from space, you know, somebody might look at it and think, oh, it looks like a, a child did it. But that's not what's important. It's about, wow, this is, was my way to express something that I experienced there, this place that really stood out to me from Earth. I wanted to share it. Um, yeah, I think it's about connection, really, yeah, in I think the, the end. The important part is what you just said. You wanted to share it. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, I mean, if you weren't, a, if, I mean, photography is certainly a way that every single one of us use to do that. Yeah. And if you weren't a photographer before you got to space, you become one because you want to, you know, selfishly for yourself, you want to capture all those memories of what you're seeing and experiencing. But it's some of the best ways to to share it with others is through that kind of imagery. And, and art, I think, is another way that does that really well. For sure. Um, what can you tell us about the International Association of uh, Astronomical Artists, which I thought was a really cool <laughs> title, actually. <laughs> Isn't it? It's so cool. And, and the people that make it up, the artists that um, make up that group are even cooler than the name, <laughs> for sure. Um, you've got people that, um, I mean, Alan Bean, so Apollo astronaut, Apollo 12 astronaut, Alan Bean, the man who was the fourth person to walk on the moon, who became a full-time artist after his NASA career, uh, you know, just a mentor to me of space and art. Um, he introduced me to this organization. And I mean, everybody from back to like a gentleman named Chesley Bonestell, who was, you know, a while ago trying to paint and express for us what we thought you know, the wonders of space would be like, and, you know, and then would paint what we learned of it. So kind of from a fantastical to a real side of how do we express the science of what's happening in space in a really beautiful artistic way, you know, um, Robert McCall, Dave Hardy. I mean, all of these people, my friend, Ron Woods, um, you know, I'm going to forget people here, but it's just <laughs> Alan, you know, all of these people that are, I don't know, just bringing the awe and wonder of space you know, that surrounds us to life for us. And um, I encourage people to check it out, you know, check out the yeah. artists that make up this group, you know, look at the way they've been able to imagine and, you know, what we don't know and share that with us to, you know, really just representing so beautifully what we do know about um, space as well. Yeah, they have a great website uh, where you can yeah, see some of really the art. Good. Really yeah, good. yeah. Uh, so once you retired from NASA, you uh, co-founded the Space for Art uh, Foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, so can you tell us a little bit, um, well, you write it, about it in the, in the book, the, this little girl in the pediatric hospital yeah. who kind of uh, made you understand what your new mission would be? Yeah, you know, I'm so thankful to, the, the, to my, my friends, my colleagues, my, you know, co-Space for Art, my, our crewmates, uh, you know, on Space for Art uh, for... Um, bringing me into this. I mean, that little girl that you mentioned, she was a little girl, probably seven years old, seven or eight, you know, going through cancer treatment at a pediatric cancer center. Um, uh, I was invited to participate in a project there, you know, and I thought, oh, I'll go, I'll paint with these kids. You know, you can kind of see there's this art space suit yeah. behind me. That's one of the creations from um, the foundation. And I thought, I'm going to go paint with, the, with these kids. Um, you know, I really just thought it was going to be this one-off thing. And this little girl and, and Ian, the guy who had founded the art and medicine program at the hospital we were at, told me, he's like, these kids who are going through what you hope is the worst thing they ever have to deal with in their lives, they will come at you with some of the most beyond their years wisdom about stuff. And, and that happened to me in this very first session where this little girl, she's like, you know, we're painting together. And she's like, oh, yeah, you know, Miss Nicole, what you do as an astronaut that must be a lot like what I'm going through here in the hospital. And I really was kind of floored by that. Like how in the world could this kid who's going through that worst thing you hope is ever happens to her, compare it to something I dreamed about, to something I loved doing. And she just kept painting and talking and she's like, yeah, you know, you don't get to go out and play with your friends the same way. You're, you can't see your family the same way. Um, there's all different kinds of food that you eat. They're doing all kinds of tests on you. Your body's changing. 
you know, there's radiation. I mean, all of it was so perfect that this comparison. And I'm like, you know, she's amazing, absolutely yeah. right. Absolutely right. Just matter of factly sharing mm -hmm. that with me. And so I don't know, in that conversation, I just felt like, man, this is more than just a one off come paint with kids at a hospital thing. And it became very clear to me that, you know, our mission at Space for Art, which we say is, you know, uniting a planetary community of children through the awe and wonder of space exploration and the healing power of art. I mean, I absolutely, without even knowing that motto at the time, you know, discovered my next mm -hmm. mission in life. And I really do. I mean, Jonathan, I really feel like, you know, all those extraordinary things that everybody says, how could anything be better than being an astronaut, than going to space, than seeing Earth from space? How could anything be better than I actually have found something that I think is better than it? Because mm -hmm. I can take all of that and now roll it into what we're doing with Space for Art and yeah. hopefully something, you know, good, better comes from it. Yeah, and can, can you tell us about those uh, those spacesuits that we see uh, see one right yeah. behind you? <laughs> yeah, that's one. Of, that's actually a flat version of yeah. of one. But so if you look at the suit, each of those individual squares or rectangles, uh, it, even the NASA patch on the front of it, is a painting by a kid. Um, in and and this one was all children at that that MD Anderson Pediatric Cancer Center, um, but we've branched out to kids all over the world. I mean, our last spacesuit that we did, we created that during the plague. We collected the artwork during the whole COVID time frame, and it's got art from at least one kid in every country on the planet. It's wow. it's so cool, and so each of the little individual pieces are quilted together by the real spacesuit company, who, like who made the suit that I did my spacewalk, <laughs> ILC Dover. They have volunteered with us since the very beginning to quilt these kids' art together into the, these art spacesuits. Um, we've had the opportunity to get a couple of them to the space station, which has been so cool, you know, have astronauts wear them inside the space station and float around and talk to the kids in the hospitals and refugee centers and stuff around the world. Um, so they see their art coming together and being in that place, which is really extraordinary. And then we've been able to branch out with some of our other folks that support us. Um, you know, Lolly Lanas, Maria Lanas, who we work with, um, you know, introduce to other ways that we can bring the kids art together because we can't always promise to send something physical to the station. Right. Yeah. So she helped us create ways that we can electronically get things to space and the kids can see their art there or um, feel like they're communicating with each yeah. other. And then very thankful to Ian, of course, for getting us started at MD Anderson and then Dave Graziosi and all the team at ILC who really they've kind of wrapped their arms around us and people at places like A Block who are willing to create things from the kids art that we can't, you know, we don't have the talent to do ourselves. And yeah, I can't imagine like those little kids seeing their, their, their art in space must be, yeah, yeah really something. Yeah. It's amazing. And it's one of the cool things too, is that we've been able to, um, I think, inspire people to take on this kind of mission of space art and healing independent of us, you know, keep doing things at their hospitals or the centers that they maybe wouldn't have thought about before. And, you know, even groups that have spun off. We have friends of ours in, in Russia, actually, who formed a group called Unity Foundation, where they have spread this space art healing thing all across the country and around the world, too, in a way that never was happening before. So it's really cool to see Very how cool. you can just be a couple people doing something you believe in and, you know, kind yeah. of the stuff that you can bring to life. And yeah, amazing. Yeah. So we just have a few minutes left. So I was wondering what excites you the most uh, about the next steps in um, space exploration? I guess you are following everything very closely. I am. I try to stay in touch. And I don't know if you heard recently, there's, uh, you know, the U.S. has their first lander on the moon. Um, that's, I mean, in over 50 years, we have the Intuitive Machines has their Nova Sea lander on the moon right now. And they're communicating and it's really cool for me because my husband, you know, so this is like like blatant um, advertising, but my husband has a company called Lone Star Data, and they are right now looking at how we uh, and testing the first of them, you know, data centers on the moon. How do we back up Earth's data, be, you know, the place for like disaster recovery and look forward to where we can have, we can be backing up and then um, processing and interacting with data in a way we never have before from the moon, this like purpose-built, you know, data storage place. 
And um, I think that's it's just one tiny little piece of this extraordinary future that we have to look forward to, right? Continuing to live out that motto of the space station where everything we're doing, you know, off the earth is for yeah. the earth, where we're looking at how do we lift, you know, harmful image you know, industry off the planet into the benign environment of space that helps us solve some of the greatest planetary challenges that we have, you know, maintain this place where we can survive and thrive here on earth and then expand ourselves to, you know, these other places in in our solar system (laughs) and beyond, you know, I'm looking forward to that Star Trek future, right? Which is a very (laughs) positive look at how, how we can extend ourselves off earth as well. Yeah. It's all about the future to me. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, as you explained, there are many challenges uh, I, just yeah. to go to Mars. Because how yeah. long does it take to go to Mars? You said uh, a few months? Uh, yeah. Right now, um, it's it's a six to nine month trip. And it's not on the, you know, Hollywood rotating ginormous spaceship. It's um, at this point, what we're thinking about is relatively small. It's not going to have an artificial gravity environment. There's going to be I, I don't I don't know what we're gonna do for exercise and how you keep the person healthy. Um, yeah, that food. seems like a big problem. Yeah. It's a big one. You know, <laughs> food. How do we? Yeah. What What are we gonna be eating in this place as we're going? I'm right. less worried about our time on Mars. I mean, we can pre-deploy stuff to Mars to have ready for us. We can actually, you know, establish farms, you know, in habitats on on Mars. But that trip, that six to nine month trip in this relatively small spaceship, where psychologically you want to have stuff you know maybe it's the computer that you play music or do art on um you want to um know that nutritionally you're going to be healthy and in good shape when you get there in addition to the exercise and there's not going to be we're not resupplying on the way to mars so are we going to be looking at (laughs) pills or little sponges that you add water to that taste good and you know um remind us of real food so we're, <laughs> Until we're, we get so we're, to Mars. we're not there yet. <laughs> yeah, we're, and, and it is. And those are the challenges of having, you know, the warm, fleshy one in the mix of the exploration. But it's so worth it, I think, for us to be part of that whole process as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, all right. Yes. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. It was You're welcome. very thanks. interesting. It would be many more subjects, but thanks for taking the time. <laughs> You are welcome. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, once again, you can find everything at uh, nicolestoll.com and spaceforartfoundation.org. This uh, was Bulletful Podcast. Thank you, everyone, and see you soon.